and Apex Lab podcast. Hey there, welcome to the Level Up Engineering podcast, where we speak to the most experienced technology leaders from around the world. So stay with us to learn actionable management insights to take your engineering team to the next level. This show, this show is powered by Apex Lab, a team of experts in end-to-end digital product development. ApexLab.io Dearest listeners and watchers, without further ado, this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast. I am your host, Carolina Tot. If you want to sponsor the podcast, check out ApexLab.io. And without saying anything else, Liam... I've become a fan of yours while preparing for this show. And in the past 30 (laughs) minutes, I've become even more of a fan. So please go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. I am just a man in a closet talking to Carolina (laughs) and um, been trying to make sure that this podcast gets to where it needs to go over the last 35 minutes. But more specifically, um, I am founder of a couple technology companies timedoctor.com, which is time tracking for remote workers, staff.com, which is time analytics for remote workers, and then also running remote, which is the largest conference on building and scaling remote teams. And our mission is we are entirely focused on building the world's transition towards distributed work. So whether that's hybrid work, whether that's fully remote, we want everyone to be able to have the opportunity to be able to work remotely because we think that will create a better world. Right. Thank you uh, for creating a better world for all of us. Um, I I think you've been doing remote since before it was cool and since before the pandemic made everyone and anyone realize how important this work might be. Well, not only before it was cool, way before it was cool, but then it got cool for about a year and a half and now it's no longer cool again. So I feel like I've gone full circle. <laughs> nice, but you have learned a lot in the meantime, I think. And we are here yes. to to discuss partially what you have learned and partially to help our listeners and watchers to see where they should take their lives with regards to remote work. But before we get into that, please tell us a bit about yourself so that our listeners can uh, maybe get to know you a little more, because um, I think you sure. are a soci- sociologist by by trade. And uh, yes, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a way, uh, a few ways of coming to becoming an ambassador for remote work. <laughs> well, yeah, and it was also so grad school for me was also a really great way for me to get out of the closet as an entrepreneur. So I was originally going to become um, a lecturer, professor at university, and that was my path. So I was in grad school pursuing a PhD in sociology. And for those of you that don't know, most first and second year classes are actually taught by graduate students. They're not taught by real professors. And so I was given my first class after about five years of TA. And I started with 300 students. I ended up with less than 150 in the worst academic reviews in the history of the department. And the department had been running for 187 years. I remember walking into my supervisor's office and I said, I don't think I'm very good at this. And he said, no, you are not. And I said, so what do you think I should do? And he said, well, you've got to get pretty good at this teaching thing if you want to pursue this career. So either get better at teaching or figure out another profession. Six weeks later, I threw my master's thesis under his door and I was out into the real world. And I actually started my first online business right then and there, which was in 2011, 2012 which was an online tutoring company. So this was very old school. We didn't have the super advanced technology like Riverside that we're sitting on right now. I had way old school tech. We were on crappy Skype lines with like half of the people that I was working with still had dial up. And we were doing virtual tutoring with students. And that was a really good business. Uh, I ran it for about three to four years. Ended up actually falling apart for the reason that we built Time Doctor, which was I couldn't actually account for the amount of time that was spent when working remotely. 
And I ended up having a big billing issue where I would bill a student for 10 hours and the student would tell me, no, I didn't work with the tutor for 10 hours. I worked with them for five. So there was no way to be able to authenticate the amount of time that was spent working with people a la our next business venture, which was Time Doctor. I love it. And uh, now it is maybe easier for all of us. However, there is a new thing we have come up with, which is before we get into the actual serious topic, I, I asked the guests. about their hot take. Uh, what is one thing that you believe to be true, but um, maybe most of the rest of the world disagrees with you on? That's the Peter Thiel question, right? Yes. Well, I think for the relevancy of this podcast, remote work is actually increasing. It's not decreasing over the last year, and it will continue to increase and not decrease over the next decade. I love it. So let's dive into our topic today because I and many other people are under the impression that um, we've been missing the human touch and everybody wants to get back to coffee break conversations at the office. And there are a bunch of different options for for employers to to do this or not to do this and um, what stats should we believe and how should we how should we evaluate um, as a business owner or as as a manager it's a very difficult question to answer because i would say as of recently there has been a lot of studies that have been coming out as propaganda and that propaganda has been spearheaded by essentially companies that are that are either directly involved in corporate real estate or a significant amount of their valuation is dependent upon corporate real estate some of the largest companies in the world uh Bain Capital uh Blackstone and when there was a recent piece that came out that looked at the sources of funding for all of these studies talking about how there was this move back to the office they identified that about a third of these studies were directly funded by these organizations so it's very very difficult to be able to find truly clear data sets that aren't biased i can point everyone to a few which i think are are quite valuable um there is the castle systems uh index which is a really interesting data set that looks at the metro usage in major metropolitan areas throughout the United States during work hours so it's a really good corollary to be able to identify how much work how much how many people are actually going to work and coming back from work every single day that has been flat and has been going back up over the last six months there is the flex index survey which is a little bit biased but is still a really good data set. There's the survey for work arrangements and attitudes and then there's the also the household pulse survey. And every single one of these will give you their version of returning to office numbers. But every single one of them has actually been showing flat return to office numbers and the majority of them actually are showing a increase. in the amount of people that are working remotely for everyone to kind of just understand the context of what i'm talking about pre-pandemic january of 2020 4% of the us workforce was working remotely by march 45% of the us workforce was working remotely that is the biggest shift in work since the industrial revolution but the industrial revolution took about 80 years and we did that in march so it changed everything that we possibly know about not just work but how we socialize the political ramifications the economic ramifications of work and i don't think we've actually fully recognized how much of an impact that is still yet to have i think we're sitting on a multi trillion dollar corporate real estate bomb that i thought would already go off but has still not actually collapsed i really like um nick bloom's perspective on this who's a preeminent academic on remote work and work in general from stanford and he has this perspective which is we're going to have a nike swoosh return back to the office so essentially what's going to happen is we saw a huge drop post pandemic and now we're starting to see those numbers slowly slowly go up by 
one to two to three percent per year. And he projects that we're back up to 50 percent of the U.S. workforce working remotely by 2040. And I would tend to agree with him. I think the numbers are pretty clear that we'll be at that point by 2040. Hmm. And so not to get off topic, but basically here is another sign that our society didn't make people's lives better. It really made businesses' lives better. And uh, perhaps we should pay more attention to how to cater to ourselves rather than businesses? I mean, for sure. Uh, I think there's a couple of things you can pull out of this. Number one, corporate real estate is If you have any corporate real estate right now, get out of it as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, the second thing is human connection. I think for the last, I would say basically post-World War II, was dependent upon your work environment. So your social network was heavily dependent upon who you worked with. That was where you got the vast majority of your quote-unquote friends. And one of the things that I've been doing is I've been working remotely since uh, 2011. And actually before that, and what I've really identified is that people have lost the ability to be able to build human connection with each other because they just don't understand how that works. You've went to grade school, then you went to university, then you went to, you know, your job. And all of these environments created a natural and natural um, process to kind of create connections with people. But for me, I actually have to go out and, and talk to people, interact with people. I'm currently in a co-working space right now, which is really cool. It's a it's a co-living environment called HOMA for remote workers that has co-working uh, integrated directly inside of it. And here they have like daily dinners with a whole bunch of remote workers that can kind of connect and you can choose who you want to be able to interact with. I tell people that At least in the West, we don't have arranged marriage, but we do have arranged friendships. Right. You're just connected with these people randomly in an office, and those are supposed to be your friends. No, there's a bigger and better world out there where if you just get out there, you're going to have deeper and more rewarding connections than you could even imagine. But a lot of people just really haven't built up that muscle yet, and I think they will over the next decade. I love it. And with that said, I... Again, not to take us off topic, but what I learned in school, I'm I'm actually a cognitive scientist by trade. What I learned in school oh, cool. is that the biggest predictor of romantic love is proximity. So this is why people are more likely to fall in love with their coworkers or their their schoolmates, because basically they just spend a lot of time with them. And if you spend a lot of time with someone, then you are that much more likely to to fall in love with them or to to create somewhat of a relationship which makes me think perhaps a lot of people are uncomfortable getting out of their comfort zone and and talking to other people but this uh co-living co-working space that you're in sounds like it's kind of bridging the gap uh between those things what other strategies would you suggest to businesses or, or companies to make their workforce perhaps more comfortable working from home? Or if they are comfortable already, <laughs> what would you what would you say to the to the other surveys that we have seen all over uh, the news? Yeah, so I wanted to answer your first question before you added on to it. Employees are very comfortable working remotely. 90% There was a recent study that came out that was actually funded by some corporate real estate companies saying that 90% of employers are planning to be able to bring people back to, into the office for 2024. But the other piece of data that was really important to mention was when you spoke to, when you surveyed the employees, 25% of them said that they would quit if they were forced back into the office. So there's this massive grinding right now, this push and pull between employee and employer. And that conflict, I think, is only going to get worse as we continue to see remote work being entrenched. And as I said before, we're flat. And arguably, we're flat. And we're probably actually going up a little bit in terms of cumulative hours spent working remotely. So to me, what managers have to really figure out is how to manage remote workers, which is a completely different process from managing in-office workers. 
the vast majority of the remote work phenomenon that occurred in 2020 was simply just recreating the office. You can't just recreate the office. It's a different way of working. I wrote a book recently called Running Remote, specifically laying out that methodology, which I call asynchronous management, to be able to work with people without necessarily interacting with them synchronously, like what we're doing right now. So the two of us are interacting synchronously, and the person that's listening to this podcast is consuming that information asynchronously when it's most advantageous for them in order to consume it. And that's the real critical component here is the entire premise of the previous way of management was the manager is a top-down system, whereas now you really have to focus, instead of management, you have to focus on leadership. You have to focus on servant leadership, which is how can I make sure that I can accelerate my team as effectively as possible It means giving them the information that they need to be able to make important decisions. And the vast majority of the time, they shouldn't be stuck on a Zoom call with you. They should actually be doing deep work. And organizations that know that grow and organizations that don't are going back to the office and faltering. I love it. And it sounds like uh, the buzzword that we are looking for is empowerment and uh, and maybe freedom of choice for, for workers um within and inside projects and those people who are responsible for delivering any kind of product what would you say to to engineering leaders who are maybe uncomfortable with this idea well i would say specifically for engineers good luck getting any of those engineers back into the office out of any other category of work engineers have the highest percentage of remote work I believe it was 67% currently, like as of last month, Mm -hmm. of engineers work remotely. So that's a big group of people. And because engineers are just in such high demand, it's very, very difficult to be able to have them go back to the office. Now, if you want to be able to force your employees to go back to the office, you're just going to have to deal with essentially B players inside of your team because the A players get to choose what they how they want to work. And this is, you know, in terms of a buyer or seller's market, it is it is a seller's market right now, right? The the engineers are really the ones that are in control. And so I'm trying to I'm trying to kind of come up with some ideas to tell a manager that's uncomfortable with managing a remote engineering team. And nothing else is coming up other than you're screwed if you think that that's the way that you need to be able to run uh, uh, an engineering team in the future. Like, it will not work. Um, I hate to be so blunt, but really, there's no other answer other than that. I love it. Uh, Go ahead and be blunt. And uh, so let's roll to the people who are excited or or maybe just open to, to this idea of asynchronous management. How would you suggest that we build a team structure that wants to work together and wants to put their best foot forward in in a business where they don't have that shared personal space? Um, My impression is that a lot of times in the past, it's been the personal relationships that made a lot of projects move forward. And when you work asynchronously, I think my immediate idea is that it's harder to to make that a reality. I would agree with that. I think that building deep relationships with your coworkers is still really important. And even in our companies, we have deep relationships. I would consider we have deep relationships with our coworkers. But the way that we do it is a little bit different. So I'll give you an example. There's a company called Todoist that I had in our book, and they run a um, task management tool and they are not only remote but they're also asynchronous and they have a really great uh, it's almost like a dungeons and dragons game that they have a that they have asynchronous on their messaging tool it's basically a version of slack called twist and so at any one point they'll get a pop-up notification saying hey the dragon has broken into the inner sanctum and everyone needs to go and slay this dragon together that type of a thing and and you have to define your role and how you who you help and it's a really interesting 
interesting um, phenomenon for us. We say synchronous is there for connection, and then asynchronous is for work. So nowhere in our kind of management philosophy is what we call show and tell meetings. So there's no meeting where someone just goes through Google Slides for 45 minutes and tells people what is on those slides. Everyone is expected before the meeting to go through the slides, watch the recording of someone that's gone through the slides at 2x speed, come up with the issues that they have about that presentation, and only discuss that as opposed to wasting eight engineers' time by having them sit on a Zoom call for an hour while someone goes through it. It's the ability to be able to consume that information and focus where we disagree or where we want to build connection as the time that we reserve for synchronous communication, not the stuff that we agree upon. The stuff that we agree upon is not important to be able to discuss. Uh, so that's one big aspect of it. And then even for us, we do connect synchronously quite a bit. So we have approximately about 10 to 15% of our work week is spent on synchronous interactions mm -hmm. with our coworkers. But that's pretty much reserved for things like uh, we use Oculus headsets and we play like, you know, zombie video games together. Or maybe we all kind of jump on and talk about the latest episode of Game of Thrones. Or we have deep conversations about people's career paths and their growth opportunities. And those are the types of things that we talk about when we're talking synchronous, not you know, whether or not you filled out your TI-83 form. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem is that the vast majority of people that are working remotely right now are, again, assuming that it's just recreating the office in which they had all of those components because interacting synchronously in an office environment costs you nothing. Everyone commutes in 90 minutes to one particular place, and then it's kind of like a synchronous collaboration buffet because you've already paid the cost of commuting into that particular location. But with asynchronous communication, you can management, you can choose exactly, basically every minute that you spend interacting synchronously, you can do so at a certain cost. So every single minute that eight engineers are sitting in a Zoom call, as an example, I know how much all those engineers cost, and I'm running up a tally. Do they have the information that they need to be able to move forward and execute on the project? If they don't, then we need to be able to have more synchronous time to be able to make sure that everyone's on the right page. But in the vast majority of the time, it's honestly 10, as I said before, 10 to 15% of their work week. And uh, most companies that I see that are successful with asynchronous management spend below 20% of their work week interacting synchronously and 80% being deep work, self-directed work, essentially, you know, mm -hmm. coding mm -hmm. as an mm -hmm. example. It sounds like uh, one of the prerequisites for any company to be able to do that is proper specification as to what needs to be done exactly. What other kinds of prerequisites are there, in your opinion, for a successful asynchronous company? So another big one is process documentation. And it is identifying everything that people need to do inside of the organization and essentially moving the responsibility of the manager as being a portal for information and moving that to a platform. So whether that's your project management system, you know, a Slack chat, uh, your, your emails, or just documents that are built up. There's a really great company called Slight.com, and they they um, they spoke at Running Remote last year. And what they do is they use a large language model to be able to analyze all of your communication inside of your organization to automatically create process documentation for you. So you can simply just ask, what is my PTO policy? And then the actual AI will tell you the answer. Here's your PTO policy. You have 14 days left. Would you like to take one? I can, you know, connect you to Bamboo HR in order to be able to make that happen. So process documentation is absolutely critical. And then I think the other part of this is making sure that you have managerial buy-in. So we've seen a whole bunch of people that have tried to go 
synchronous or sorry, asynchronous fail because the managers want to feel useful. And one of the most interesting pieces of information that I got in, in researching this book was that the managerial layer of asynchronous organizations was 50% of their in-office counterparts. So there were half as many managers in asynchronous organizations as there are in synchronous organizations, which sounds really great if you're not a manager, but if you're a manager, you're freaked out by this. And so I think a lot of managers that are returning to more individual contributor work is scary for them. And that's another big factor is making sure that they have buy-in, recognizing, hey, maybe you're not going to be a manager full time. Maybe you're only going to be a manager 50% of the time, but you're actually going to be able to get back and do some really cool work. Like you're going to be able to get back and do some coding as an example, which maybe you really missed. But now because you're a full-time manager, you <laughs> the other part that really pisses me off about this and just generally in all of tech is the way that you rise up in an organization is by becoming a manager. So if you're a really, really good engineer, the only way for you to make more money is to become like a VP of engineering. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but now you're no longer an engineer. Now you're just a manager managing people. And you're probably a really shitty manager if you are a really good engineer. What you should do is, I, I believe we should actually rethink that entire process to say, what's the minimum amount of management required for us to be able to build the things that we want to be able to build and how much of that information can we send off to a platform as an example to be able to make those things work it's um that's a pretty crazy concept and not many people really agree with me on it but i do see companies that do this at scale wordpress is a really good example uh, gitlab is another really great one that works entirely entirely asynchronously and they're both multi-billion dollar companies that do it very, very successfully. And they really have all of their managers focused on, well, my goal is not to tell you what to do. My goal is to listen and figure out what you did and how to try to make you do better work. I love it. And I also completely agree with you. And perhaps it's because I tend to invite people who are quite forward thinking to the show, but I think I have... I have received this this opinion so many times that I am starting to think, you know, like maybe this is how the world works now. And then I go out in the real world and I I interact <laughs> I interact with companies as a as a as an outside consultant and I see that this is not how the real world works and the and what you just said is still the case that uh, people who are really good engineers are promoted to becoming managers. Uh, so okay. So I think lots of forward thinking people are uh, of the same mindset, but it's hard to make a change. I actually think that, you know, uh, this this society that we live in is is more catering to businesses. And at the end of businesses, there are people because, you know, like businesses are, are just legal entities. But mm -hmm. but somehow... And this profit-oriented thing that we have created is making people be okay with making other people's lives less happy? Well, so I have an interesting perspective on that because I am a hardcore capitalist. But I will tell you that capitalism... The, the, enti the entire concept behind capitalism is that it's an organic market, right? It's like... I'm going to try to build a better mousetrap. Oh, I'm going to have this. I'm going to have this on my mousetrap. Well, I'm going to put this other thing on my mousetrap. And eventually we come up with the best mousetrap. For work, that doesn't work. <laughs> and it's really, and that's another hot take that I have. So for work, the open concept work environment. So it was like, Basically, Facebook really started it, which was, let's not have offices, let's not have cubicles, let's just have an open space where everyone works. Study after study after study after study shows that that is incredibly unproductive for people's overall output. And yet, it still exists. Why? Why does it still exist? Because I think there's a, 
a really bad feedback loop specifically on human resources. And the data connected to human resources is almost entirely quantif uh, is entirely quali uh, uh, qualitative. It's not necessarily very quantitative. There's not that much data. It's not like a one or zero dialectic. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you look at the kind of the, the, the capitalist economy around labor, it's just such a weird system. Um, and I think it's almost entirely ego-based. So I think the vast majority of reasons of why people do what they do in a work environment is, I had a very small chapter in the book where I talked about how I was working in a co-working space, just like the co-working space I'm in right now. And there was this woman um, who was, she had like half the co-working space. So it was like maybe 50 people and she, her 25 of her employees were in this co-working space. And she would scream and yell and belittle her employees all of the time. And she was a horrible person. <laughs> uh, Not to remember, make broad strokes, but... And, <laughs> and I would just go in and I would do my work every single day. And one of these days, and you could hear her like in the entire co-working space. Like you couldn't get any work done because she would just scream and yell at people all day long. And one day there was a meeting that she was having that everyone in the co-working space could hear talking about how we need to talk to more, and this was an agency, we need to talk to bigger companies like Shopify and Time Doctor. And then the CTO that was in that meeting said, oh, you mean Liam's company? And I had been working in that comp I had been working in that co-working space for two years. She did not know my name. I mean, she must have walked by my desk eight hundred times um, over those two years. More than that, two thousand times. She didn't even know my name. Why? Because I wasn't important. It was serving her ego. She had all of these people. She treated them like shit all the time. And the thing that pissed me off the most is the moment that she knew that I ran a big business, she was my best friend. We were having lunch together. How are you, Liam? What's going Like the energy completely changed. And I thought, what an asshole. Like how horrible of a person were you <laughs> where I was completely useless to you yesterday. And now I'm the center of your world just because you could possibly get something out of me. And I find that that's the majority of, um, you know, like A level personality people that are just so focused on building out big companies. Uh, and I'm not saying that I'm not, but I think that we have to really look at the grand scheme of things and say, well, maybe the reason why people want to be able to have everyone go back to the office is because they get a massive ego boost from being in a physical space and telling people what to do. I And that's and for someone who has had that power, I got to tell you, it's very exciting to tell people what to do. It gives you an ego boost, but you're an asshole if you really, really like it and you don't really understand that that's who you truly are. Right, right. And what I was going to say um, just a little ways back when you talked about uh, asynchronous work and not being in meetings with your with your individual contributors, actually letting them work is I thought, you know, a lot of uh, managers who I, I see in not so forward thinking companies are people who go to work and unknowingly they seek this this ego boost of being paid attention to of having people talk to them or having people listen to them in meetings and and really uh, they don't trust other people, perhaps partially because they don't trust themselves. And mm. and I think, mm. you know, like when there is something that should be so obviously changed in, in a process or, or in how a company operates, more often than not, I feel or I, I experience that somebody in that company is getting something out of how the things are working at that moment and they are the ones who are holding back the change. And so it's more important than ever to pay attention to other people 
And I think that starts by paying attention to ourselves and how we operate in the world. I, yeah, I have. Um, so whenever I disagree with something almost immediately from an emotional perspective, I immediately check myself to figure out where my bias exists inside of that decision. So if I immediately think, oh, that's a, that's a really bad idea. I catch myself and I try to analyze why. And the majority of the time, it's connected to some deep-seated issue, connected to my ego, connected to the way I think things should be, rather than right versus being individually right versus doing what's right for the business is very, very difficult for a lot of managers, unfortunately. Even though they say that they're doing everything for the business, I think when you break down all of those micro decisions, the majority of the time, they're doing what's right for Liam as opposed to doing what's right for the company. And that's really a shame. Um, and hopefully it's something that can change. Maybe you can help change it because you obviously have the education to be able to kind of analyze it in a way that I can't. But uh, it is incredibly frustrating when you see all of these people being forced back to an office that don't want to go simply because I believe the managers just say, I want to boss people around mm-hmm. and I like it. Mm-hmm. So if we, we are at this point, um, I know we are soon running out of all of our time, but um, one thing that I usually suggest to the people who are trying to create change within a company is that there is strength in numbers. And so if they don't like a boss or if they don't like a manager or if they don't like one of the coworkers, of course, there is space for feedback and and, uh, honest conversations. But if they can't individually create change, then they should always look to other people because their feedback is only one data point. But when it's, Mm. you know, like, seven people saying, we don't want to come back to the office and we have the numbers to show for our productivity. They should, they should come together and, and share what they feel should be done or what they feel is right. What other techniques or tricks or, or, or tips would you give to people who don't think that it's a good idea for them to return to the office? What, what, should, they, what should they do? How should they present themselves? Or what data should they rely on? So it's really tough. What I mentioned at the top of this podcast are some really good data sets that they can check out. Flex Index is putting out a lot of really great information connected to this. Any of the academic articles by Nick Bloom from Stanford are really big. But the biggest question that I have for employers that are forcing their employees back into the office is why was the lower output over the last three years? Because I'll tell you, two years ago, everyone was saying it was fantastic. Everyone was saying we can work from home, no problem whatsoever. Uh, Productivity is up, output is up. And even though there are a few studies that show that remote work is less productive than in-office counterparts, the vast majority, and I'm talking 98% plus, of academically referenced studies that have come out have shown that remote work is more productive than in-office work. Um, And essentially it boils down to two core issues, commute and disruption. So if you simply had the same amount of work hours, but someone could get an extra two hours of sleep per day. So you take the time that they're gonna spend commuting and you get them to sleep, they will be more productive by far and large, even with all of the other collaboration points that you quote unquote lose in that process, they're still going to be a lot more productive. And and there's a lot of data sets to be able to prove that out. The second part is the argument towards collaboration. And I think that the problem is that it's just like, it's a cart before the horse type of problem because when you look at collaboration at scale, this is exceptionally clear when you look at engineering. The vast majority of engineering is asynchronous anyways. If I'm communicating with you through a JIRA ticket or through Slack, 
that's asynchronous. Why do I need to be forced onto a call to be able to talk about, you know, my, my quarterly planning as an example? An engineer really doesn't need to be able to do that. Other people can do that work. And even them, they don't have to do it for that particularly long. So being bugged, being pulled out of your flow state focus is the biggest barrier towards successful work in general. And remote work just creates an environment where you have less of those disruptions. Um, I have a, a saying that I put in the book, which is, as a manager, your job should be to make sure that your employees are disrupted as little as humanly possible. They receive as less disruption as humanly possible. And unfortunately, you as the manager are generally the top source of disruption for them. So just by simply removing yourself from that process, you're going to actually increase the overall output and productivity of your entire team. So, I mean, those are my two biggest points. But again, since we we're talking about, we talked about before, which was HR doesn't seem to have the same advantages in a capitalist economy than other products and services. I don't have that much faith that we're actually going to get to a point in which workers are happier because I've seen this time and time again that when you sprinkle in ego and you get that to interact with what's best for the company, more often than not, the ego wins, which is really sad but true. Hmm. Let's not end on that note. Super f***ing depressing. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, say, we'll talk about something else. <laughs> We have talked about a lot of things. And so usually I end by by maybe summarizing my keyest takeaways from the conversation. And mm -hmm. what I hear in this conversation today, first of all, is that even research-backed data should be researched and and you should always look at what the sources of funding were for the research that you're looking at. I think a lot of Absolutely. people often forget that. Also... You should do your own research and um, whatever we talked about today, go ahead and and check out what you can find in your industry or, or for yourself. Um, also, what I hear is that uh, there is a lot of uh, need for for people working on themselves and and perhaps walking, uh, working um, personally with someone outside of the organization, a psychologist or a coach or someone who can give you real mirroring and feedback and can pay attention to you and can help you make yourself better for the betterment of everybody around you. Also, I what I hear is that perhaps there is a very specific amount of uh, synchronous work that is sufficient for a productive company mm -hmm. and uh, each company should figure out what that is for themselves. But from what I hear you say, if it's above 20%, then maybe you are not doing everything that you can in your power. Go ahead. At minimum, measure it. Sure. Yes, exactly. And maybe that is the biggest, that is the, that is the minimum viable dose to really unlock your next level in asynchronous management is for a week, audit how many hours you spend on Zoom. It'll blow your mind. Uh, the one data set that I have seen on this that I do trust says that 56% of someone's work week post-pandemic for new companies that went remote was spent on video conferencing tools. 56% of their time was spent on Zoom calls. Now, that seems insane to me because <laughs> essentially for 56% of your work week, you're talking about how to do work, but you're not actually doing any. How productive are you going to be if you're spending 56% of your day talking about what you're going to do as opposed to actually doing it? So measure your data. That's the biggest thing that I would suggest that people do. You can do it for a week. Uh, time Doctor can do it very easily. You can also use Screen Time on Apple um, products, which is very, very easy to use. Just look at your data and it will blow you away. Guaranteed. For sure. For sure. And uh, without regards to our conversation today, it will give you a lot of insight about your personal life also. 
and Absolutely. and where maybe uh, it's it's best for you to be mindful of your of your screen time consumption. So we have talked about a lot of things and I very much enjoyed our conversation today um, about perhaps not returning to the office, but uh, but the basically the the difference between perspectives about returning to the office or or hybrid models of work. Uh, and I love your point about measuring what you're doing and then and then making judgments based on that. Is there anything else that you would like to add to our conversation today? The biggest thing that I'd love to leave everyone with is remote work is not going away. If I can just reinforce one single point, it's not going away. And you have to understand how to manage it. And if you don't, you will be left behind in the future of work. So be mindful of that. Recognize how to manage that type of work. And I think not only em your employees, but you yourself as a manager or even an owner of a business will be much better for it. I love it. I And for our listeners, uh, we mentioned last month, we are recording this episode towards the, the end of February of 2024. Uh, but I think uh, we have we have talked about some evergreen ideas uh, about remote work and, and management uh, asynchronously. My guest is Liam Martin. Liam, please share uh, to our listeners and watchers where they can follow your work and your companies. Sure. So timedoctor.com, you can sign up for a 14-day free trial of that software there. If you're interested in coming to Running Remote, we run it every single year. And this year, it's going to be April 22nd in Lisbon, Portugal. We have the best speakers in the world. We're the largest conference on remote work um, for the past five years. And if you want to follow me personally, I think probably the best place to do that is on YouTube. If you go to youtube.com slash running remote, all of our talks are up there for free. And I also do a lot of videos specifically on stuff like this, data sets connected to remote work, where it's going, where I think it's going, and uh, you can check us out there. Thank you. And, and you have some great predictions about where the world is going. So I suggest everyone check out the, the content. Thank you for joining Level Up Engineering. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, dearest listeners and watchers, um, I am Carolina Tuot. This was the Level Up Engineering podcast. But before I let you go, I ask you to please check out apexlab.io. They are our sponsor and uh, they have software development services. So uh, if you're looking for an external partner, they could be uh, the best partner for you. They are really great at working asynchronously and at working remotely. And with that said, I hope to see you next time. Thanks for staying with us. This was the Level Up Engineering Podcast by Apex Lab. Check them out at apexlab.io. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel, rate our content, and share your thoughts on this episode. See you next time.